was born and raised in the South, in Virginia, and I lived in the Deep South for a good part of my life. And so this is a very solemn and very important event in my life to go back to ground zero. You read about it, you've seen it on television, you've seen film footage, to go back to where it actually existed in person is extraordinarily traumatic and extraordinarily personal, but for my soul, this is good for me. And I hope and pray Allah that everybody, each and every person here, takes a bit of that with them to never, ever, ever forget. Yeah, Allah, please have us have a safe journey as we are here in these days recognizing the struggles of the African American people. Ya Rabbil Alameen, please guard and secure and keep peaceful the hearts of those who are suffering trauma. Ya Allah, please have mercy upon our pious Muslim ancestors who gave their lives and shed their blood here on this land, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanahu rabbika bi'asati ma yasifun. It's very important for us to understand that the United States of America was built by African Americans, but not for African Americans. why you sit on this bus today, that you can sit on this bus and you can take this pilgrimage is because somebody sacrificed for you to be able to take this pilgrimage. You have the privilege and honor of walking in their footsteps without the same risks to your safety. So I am grateful to be on this journey with you and those at CARE who take a lot of risks on behalf of our community. I think Muslims take a lot for granted. They are inherited the benefits of the civil rights movement. So they need to learn what that meant and how, it, how it's playing out today. And then understand that, you know, these people stood up when, they, when it was hard to stand up. Birmingham, Selma, Montgomery, that's hallowed ground, historically hallowed ground. Welcome to the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. I need you to think for one moment, what must it be like to be untouchable all day long? There were even laws that said that you couldn't look a person in their eye. It's a crime called eyeballing. In Alabama in 1900, we craft a constitution that is infamous as the longest constitution in the world. The United States Constitution has 27 amendments. Alabama's constitution has over 860. On this wall, I have my victim, who is reading these segregation ordinances, and since she's doing so, I'm going to get her to read them out loud so that everybody can hear them. It shall be unlawful to conduct a restaurant or other place for the serving of food in the city at which white and colored people are served in the same room, unless such white and colored persons are effectually separated by a solid partition extending from the floor upward to a distance of seven feet or higher and unless a separate entrance from the street is provided for each compartment. You know, I, I grew up and, and lived through a lot of this stuff, and I know pretty much have seen all of it, all the major events. Our history books don't tell the whole story. And my mother used to say, half the truth is a whole lie. Now, as we look at these two classrooms, the boards are very different. The floor is different. The books here would not go over there until this classroom was done with those books. They were all worn out. Some of them, sometimes the information's outdated. And let's just be honest. Some people would write things in these books because they knew where these books were going. Some teachers would have what they called erase day, where you'd open your book and you had to go through it looking for ugly messages that had been left by the kids that had the books before. There was no 11th grade 
and a 12th grade for a person of color because you were heading to that mine. If you were female, you were heading to somebody's kitchen or you were heading to their home to take care of their children and take care of their family. Our mission statement at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute is to take the lessons of the civil rights and human rights movements from the past in our present to try to chart a better future. At what had to be the lowest point of the American Civil Rights Movement, Dr. Martin Luther King was urging people to continue. And that's what a leader does. A leader takes you at your lowest point, picks you up, and reminds you why you started whatever it is in the first place. All in favor, let it be known by standing on your feet. All black people ever got from Congress was debate. All they ever got from the president was rhetoric. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. On Good Friday, Martin Luther King is going to be arrested. Bull Connor puts him in isolation, does not allow him access to the outside world. This was to shake Birmingham in their faith in Dr. King. And so he can't let that go without a response. And so he pins the letter from a Birmingham jail. These bars and that stool are the exact bars that Dr. King was locked behind when he wrote that letter. To understand that the deep sense of dedication and determination that those people went through, they paid for the freedoms of African Americans with their very blood. Voltaire said the following. He said, if you could lead people to believe in absurdity, then you could lead people to commit atrocities. That information hit me again today. I mean, I saw this stuff as a child. I was a teenager when Dr. King was killed. You know, sometimes I feel like we get lost in the work. We don't really understand what civil rights mean. These people weren't looking at things like how much money they had. Dr. King died poor. Malcolm died poor and young, both of them, with small children. That's what I mean by sacrifice. They knew. First Congregational is the only church in Birmingham, Alabama that had an interracial congregation. It was illegal for people of color and white people to worship together. But when we look at these churches, most notable is 16th Street Baptist Church, was known as everybody's church because it was the largest facility in the black community in Birmingham. The first four-year high school for black students was born in that church. The graduations were held in that church. The first black bank in Birmingham was created in that church. And the name of the church when it was first organized was not 16th Street Baptist Church. The name of the church was the first colored church of Birmingham. All of these windows on this side of the church were destroyed except the one in the center here, the uh, window of Christ. That window was damaged. The face of Christ is blown out of that window. So the bomb goes off, it blows the side of the church into the girls' bathroom. And four of the five girls that were in the bathroom were killed. One survived. The survivor's name was Sarah Collins, is Sarah Collins, because she's still alive today. She is 66 years old. She lost one of her eyes in the blast. Her sister, Addie Mae Collins, was one of the four girls that was killed. The other three young ladies that was killed was Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, and Carol Robinson. They did not die in vain. God still has a way of wringing good out of evil. History has proven over and over again that unmerited suffering is redemptive. I was on my way to church when that happened. We haven't changed that much. We've made some progress, but we haven't really changed like we think we have. You know, a lot of this stuff was institutionalized. I don't think people really knew. There are many folks who didn't know that this was the law. Segregation was the law, just like immigration laws that we have now that are unfair. It's really, it's unspeakable. It's very hard to talk about. It's very hard to articulate, you know, what happened here. And it wasn't that long ago either. And that's what is so frightening about it. To be honest with you, I don't know what my family was doing during the civil rights movement. 
And I think that that would go to say that they were being complicit. Mass incarceration, unjust police shootings. Uh, the struggle has continued just in a very different way. That is an absolute devil. Devil! I shall I never forgive. Like, I have never, my ever forgive. Like, I shall yeah. never forgive. Never forgive. No matter what happens to us, there will be nothing near what has happened to African Americans hundreds of years ago and what continues to happen until today. People are in denial and some people even don't believe that what happened has happened and African Americans should forget about it. They cannot forget about it and we have to recognize what happened for so many years and pledge our organization to be true fighters for justice. This is the place where they were confronted by the police who were ready to kill them, to beat them, and stop the action and stop the march. And today we are walking free of fear, but the struggle continues for their people and for us and for all humanity. When these folks decided to go over that bridge, they already knew that on the other side of the bridge there was going to be potential violence, and they knew that some of them were going to lose their lives. But they went anyway. And one of the things that I always say to our Muslim community, and a lot of those people, if, if not all of those people, we forget in the civil rights movement at the time, were people of faith. They believed in God. The Evans Pettus Bridge, the Bloody Sunday, you see the pictures. You see the video. It affects you in a certain way, but not like when you are there and you're seeing the history of it unfold. This whole thing about civil rights is based on the faith. What happened here in this state and other states was legal. It was legal. Segregation was legal. These people were breaking the law. And this is the real struggle. The real struggle is not what they're doing. The real struggle is how we are responding to it. People claiming to be Christians were beaten up on other Christians. That's the struggle. It's the psychological effect. We saw the memorials there, the graves. It was a gloomy weather, gloomy mood, somber mood. So nature was very compatible to my sentiments yesterday. People would be in church worshiping and come out and look for somebody to lynch as part of the afternoon entertainment. This wasn't just, are they mad because you did something? This is just entertainment. And people would have their families there. And today we got PG ratings on television. And at that time, they would allow their child to see a man being hung, quartered, lynched, burned alive, etc. People are not afraid of Muslims because of terrorism because no terrorism could have been any worse than what we experience here in this country. People are afraid of Muslims because they're on a trajectory to be prominent in this country and nothing free these people but faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, O mankind, we have created you from a single male and female and made you into nations and tribes so that you know one another. And we have been hearing horrifying stories about what humanity did to itself when it failed the basic test of knowing one another and appreciating one another. Muslims who live in Alabama, you're surrounded by legacy of oppression. What went wrong could go wrong again. What's the difference? We were not there hundreds of years ago. The thing is, we are here today. I use Islamophobia as a bridge to the civil rights movement in my presentation, just to kind of put people in, in, a, in a space and time. The African-American churches were firebombed regularly during the civil rights movement, and not to say that, that African-American churches are not still targeted, they are. 
but now we have the mosque that was firebombed in Florida. Mosques can't even be built. Communities can't even get a permit before they're being terrorized. And so the way I see Muslim community members targeted is the same way I see African American community members continue to be targeted. Some students came up to Morris and said, who are, who are these other people you're talking about? We recognize Dr. King, but who's Banker Evers? Who's Emmett Till? Well, already these names were lost to history. So we erected the memorial as a way to educate young people and adults. The thing that gets you is to think about the sacrifices that those people made uh, the, and absolutely facing death almost every day if they didn't toe the line that they were supposed to tell. Michael Donald was a 19-year-old black man that was abducted by two men who belonged to a group called the United Clans of America. 1981, abducted in Mobile, Alabama. They took him to a remote location, cut his throat, then brought him back to a neighborhood and hung him from a tree. This is often referred to as the last lynching. It's still going on. I mean, I'm, I've been around a minute, and we're still having police brutality and murder. The difference is the technology that we have now. We didn't have that technology in the past, but they were able to utilize television effectively. But still, you're seeing absolute issues that people are filming and putting on Facebook, and Twitter, Instagram, etc. In 1954 with Brown v. Board, which is said to mark the beginning of the modern American Civil Rights Movement. Um, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously that segregated schools were unconstitutional, overturning Plessy v. Ferguson that said that segregated schools were just fine. And it was that that really inspired people to kind of start demonstrating and demanding change in their own communities. And then we start here with a plaque to each of the, we call them martyrs to the movement. I really appreciate being able to see their faces and it simply states their name, date, and place of death. And certainly they were more than that. They were stories, they were people. We can see that some were children, some were young. Some didn't even have a picture. John Reese was 15 years old. He was killed in 1955, and his family did not have a picture of him before he was taken. We uh, walked through the, walked through the display and entered into the Hall of Martyrs. <coughs> and that was overwhelming. The area where we're going to in Montgomery was actually one of the most prolific slave markets in the Americas. National Memorial for Peace and Justice will open to the public April 26. It contains 805 steel markers, one for each county where lynchings took place. So you start with them at eye level, and then on this quarter, they begin to rise. Montgomery is the place where people stood up to fight against segregation and they were confronted with dogs and with police officers with batons and, and fire hoses, and they were brutalized and jailed, and some were killed, and yet they kept fighting. Following enslavement, we had decades of terrorism and violence, and people don't realize that the demographic geography of this nation uh, was shaped by this terrorism. Uh, the black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Newark and Detroit and Los Angeles and Oakland did not go to those communities as immigrants. They went to those communities as refugees and exiles from terror. And in this new America, we're going to create something, I hope, that feels more like justice and equality and fairness. But we have to understand the kind of America we have created to understand the kind of America we need to create. I'm proud that CARE came to be a part of this celebration of these new institutions. And I look forward to the partnerships that we create, that we sustain by holding one another, supporting one another, loving one another in that struggle for justice. So I want to thank everybody at CARE for being a part of this moment, of this history, of this journey. I don't know if the wounds ever close, but it's like reopening wounds. I'm not the same person that I was when I came down here. This was a life-changing journey, which everyone must take at least once in their lifetime, as we continue to struggle together for justice and equality for all. <laughs>